two, one. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to another antinatalist conversation, hangout, um, group of people conversing. Um, today, I'm joined once again by question mark. Um, I will provide a link to his channel below, as I do ask you to subscribe to his channel. Some um, fantastic conversations being had there also, and he often streams um, study and chill sessions where he looks at um, interesting philosophical matters, not just related to antinatalism. He is into many other related matters like veganism, effective altruism and such. Um, I'm also joined by Wicked Energy. Wicked Energy is this witty man who haunts the comment sections of uh, YouTube and has often uh, denigrated my good name. <laughs> um, but apologies. he is fun and I, uh, <laughs> I enjoy his, uh, his input. And he, he seems to have a, an avid interest in, 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 in you know, ongoing concerns. So it's, it's good to talk to him. Um, guys, would you like to say hello? Mark, perhaps go first. I know everybody knows you, but yeah, for those that don't. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, as Ao said, um, into, I just started um, adding live streaming to my channel. And uh, sometimes I just chill and... Uh, hang out and study some various topics in philosophy and that's been fun so yeah that's me yeah. and wicked energy hi uh, i'm wicked energy uh, you know i've been uh, heard of natalism antinatalism like uh maybe a year year ago maybe i think uh was it 2019 or maybe it was two years ago now actually and uh yeah i just find it an interesting community and uh you know, it's nice to uh, chat to some other people. You know, I only usually chat on Sundays. So <laughs> that's kind of over now. And uh, I'm here. I was checking out Question Mark Stream. He invited me to the ENI Discord. And uh, now I'm here. Okay. It's interesting. So on a Sunday, you used to hang out with um, what did you do on a Sunday? Did you used to talk to people? For those that uh, don't just, know. Uh, uh, just uh, the 12 noon thing that you were on. Like, I remember you were chatting to uh, Superhuman Dance, so I, I would just do that with him. Oh, on right. Sunday, going through the floor chart every single Sunday. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah, it just um, made me feel well, like I was doing something. We all have, we all have um, hobbies, I suppose. Some of them, yeah. um, <laughs> some of them are more interesting than others. Um, so, Mark. Um, do you want to ask anybody any questions or anything, you know? Yeah, I'd be interested. Front of your mind. Uh, um, well, um, yeah, I'm curious, Wicked, how you got introduced into the philosophy. How did, uh, how did you come about it? Um, Vegan Gaines and his girlfriend, Jasmine, well, I guess his wife, Jasmine, had an interaction with someone at a restaurant and they had a, an altercation with this couple or something, and they made a video about it. And uh, that's when I first heard, uh, so she, Jasmine referred to these people as breeders, which is uh, maybe considered a bit derogatory. But uh, yeah, and you know, Jasmine and Richard didn't want children, and they ended up discussing antinatalism with superhuman dance. That's when I first heard of it. Okay, interesting. Hmm. And, and then... Uh, Perspective philosophy and superhuman dance had a discussion as well. And uh, that's when I, when I heard of perspective philosophy, and he's a PhD, and he was a very interesting guy. But I thought that uh, some of the arguments in the comment section were interesting. I guess after that, when I chatted to, I was in like a, voice, uh, a text chat, a YouTube chat, on uh, one of superhuman dance's videos. And superhuman dance was saying some stuff, and I had uh, some reason, and you know, I was putting out, I can't remember now, but. Uh, this Final Fantasy guy, he commented and uh, he was just refuting all my arguments and pointing out how they're, you know, fallacious reasoning. That's like an appeal to this, it's like an appeal to that. And, you know, 
like uh, he just really took me apart in the in the text chat and i was like wow this guy uh there could be something to this you know and uh from there uh, i asked the superhuman dance guy I said, well, you know you seem like a crazy person but uh what uh what what, what do you who should i pay attention to in the community and he mentioned in mendham drive energy and david benatar and i watched uh, sam harris a uh, discussion with david benatar and uh this other discussion with david benatar and david really knew what he was talking about and uh, really held his own and he had uh you know he, he had kind of academic weight and uh it added a lot more credibility to the arguments okay cool okay um that's quite um an introduction to the, to the philosophy and um, where do you sit with it now wicked like how, how do you feel about it and what has it brought well, to I, your life finding out about it well you know i see a lot of people a lot of teen pregnancies i see a lot of uh you know unplanned pregnancies that kind of thing i see uh you know that kind of thing i've avoided that in my life and uh you know i just think uh gosh if i had kids i i mean you know i'm not working at the moment uh not feeling 100 percent, you know and uh gosh i don't think i'd be able to take care of them you know and i think uh in my own life uh I think about my parents, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, the offering a nice hat and, you know, my parents weren't very well educated, they weren't very wealthy, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, I mean, my life seems to be, you know, it's, it's pretty enjoyable. You know, I had a lot of laughs with people, I feel like a very lucky man, but some other people have not been so lucky, I think. And uh, I just can't imagine, you know, my mother was a cancer surviving diabetic dialysis patient. And, you know, she also had back pain and stuff and, you know, and uh, she died a few years ago of uh, septicemia and internal hemorrhaging caused by two different types of cancer. So I just think, man, that can happen to anybody. You know, that could, that's, a, that's such a, yeah. a rough go of life. Like, that's really just, you know, like, and then I found out, you know, people have uh, like a combination, you know, they've got the arthritis, they've got the high blood pressure, they've got the asthma, they've got the diabetes, they got, you know, four or five illnesses by the time they're like 60, you know? So, I mean, nearly everybody's getting a rough go of it, it seems. Uh, yeah, it, it is the case. But... I, just Sorry, to, yeah. I just want to let you know, uh, Ellie joined the room. Yeah, I see that. Um, I, I, I suppose, I just want to say to Wicked, I'm very sorry that, um, you know, to hear that about your mother. Um, I can't imagine, um, you know, your young man must have been, um, extremely painful to, to go through all that um, at such a young age. Um, I know you're nearly 30 or so, isn't that right? You're around that age. Yeah, yeah, um, 28. Yeah, I'm sorry you went through yeah. that. Yeah, so, um, and yeah, you're right. It, do, it does seem that um, most people have comorbid conditions as they get older. You know, you, you, there's not many people out there who escape life without something really fucking them up in some way or other. Um, it's just a matter of time, uh, unfortunately, for most people, um, for their health to start impacting them negatively. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's something I think about. It's something, yeah, that I think about um, the risk inherent in creating life. Um, I mean, you don't know what you're um, creating. You don't know what harm will come to that person um, health-wise. Um, I feel like you kind of guarantee that there's going to be like a negative health outcome near the end of your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't. I, fi you I find can't. it, uh, it's sad. It's a complete, complete gamble. Oh, by the way, let's not be rude. Let's now say hello to um, yes. L. How, how would you like to be known, L? Uh, will I call you L? Hi, yeah, it's L. I'm just, I'm just trying to plug my phone in because i've just noticed that um i haven't got much battery on my um phone That's and okay. i just realized that my phone charger is broken so <laughs> i'm not going to be able to join in for very long i don't think right okay well um so you basically can't charge your phones so you're kind yeah, of yeah <laughs> yeah for this conversation right okay how long is all right well listen um if we lose you um at some point or you can come back another time maybe next week or whenever we chat again 
Um, I suppose we better concentrate on L, uh, guys. Um, yep, that's fine. Right. Right. She's, she's here for a limited time. Um, so, how, uh, yeah. how many people am I talking to? Who's here? There's myself, uh, there's Question Mark, and there's uh, uh, a man called uh, Wicked Energy. He's a YouTube commenter. Um, uh, he likes to comment in the YouTube videos and stuff. That's how we kind of um, linked up. Okay. So there's three of us. Yeah. So um, I kind of I've spoke to you before on Twitter, L. So would you like to uh, introduce yourself at all um, to the others? Um, it's okay. I'll just um, plug some headphones in so I can hear you. Um, introduce introduce myself. Um, Lifelong antinatalist, before I even knew what antinatalism was, I was quite surprised that it was kind of a philosophy, but pleased. Um, and yeah, just sort of uh, good to talk to other people that, um, that, that share this quite unusual viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how does it feel um can i ask just how do you feel in general about reality i suppose life <laughs> predicament what humans are about about reality and what humans are i'm i'm quite i'm quite misanthropic so um because there are different um different arguments for antinatalism aren't there? There, there there are sort of the um altruistic arguments and then there are the non-altruistic arguments um and mine aren't altruistic <laughs> i kind of don't want right, right. i i don't want to i don't want anybody to suffer but then i see what our species are are doing to cause suffering in other, in in not only ourselves but in other species. So um, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of sounds like you don't like you don't think people are that nice. You wouldn't want to subject another human to that. Uh, I'm with you there. Um, yeah. I, I I do worry about you know, the effect of other people's behavior on people brought into this world, like, a, you know, possible bullying, the possible oppression, harassment, you know, rape, um, psychopathic fixation um, on them, um, all, all manner of things, exploitation, wage slavery, all, all the things that humans have created and humans do. Um, yeah, I, I don't really like a vast portion of humanity. But then yeah. I also do personally have the kind of philanthropic uh, thing as well, where I do do like people and I do care. And I also, because of like, I see the world as a deterministic uh, place where there's a cause and effect. I, I, I realize that even the monsters, it's not their fault that they're monsters, you know, they didn't choose to be who they are. And that's, that's a terrifying thing. Like, you know, uh, even the people we hate, well, unfortunately they are just, the way they are because of their nature and uh, again they didn't choose that so there is a kind of you can even stretch the kind of philanthropic kind of um you know sentiment to the monsters as well if you like you, you can kind of if you like have that much empathy that you kind of almost feel sorry for them in a way because it's not their fault it's not their fault that they're you know compelled to do horrible things that we find shocking and frightening and awful. I mean, who in their right mind would choose to do those things, you know? Um, so yeah, I have a little bit of empathy for them, but obviously it's, it's, it's difficult because the lizard brain in me wants to like, you know, punish them and beat them and, you know, eradicate them. Um, but the kind of rational sense in my brain, the kind of intellectual part of my brain thinks, you know, it's not their fault and maybe we should just separate them from society and, you know, keep them <laughs> in pens or whatever away from causing harm. Um, because again, they didn't, they didn't choose to be these, these harmful beings. Um, it's a very difficult thing. And I, I like, uh, what do you think, Mark? 
no i i agree um <laughs> yeah i don't uh i don't have you said it well do you, do you do any of you support the death penalty what no i don't there's there's like practical implications of that in terms of like um it, you know, there's there's people that have been found innocent, and then they they get you know put to death, and then um, the amount of the cost to to go through that whole process, uh, you know, you can just put them in jail. So I don't know. I'm not in favor of like uh, of the death penalty. Yeah, I, I'm not in favor of it because of possible um, miscarriages of justice. Number one. Yeah, which has, um, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, it does happen. And again, you see some ridiculous cases where there's people with an IQ of like under 50 who, you know, don't know what the hell they're doing or some person who had like, you know, extreme mental illness or something or some woman who was severely abused and like killed an abusive partner or something in a, in a kind of, you know, act of psychological trauma. Um, you do see sad cases, and um, yeah, that, I, I'm not. I'm not for it. What about um, you, L? It's mm, it's a difficult one. Um, in terms of in terms of suffering, um, w when I mean, it's it's possibly worse to spend a lifetime in prison. It, it, isn't that? Isn't that potentially um, more of a punishment than actually ending somebody's life? That's yeah. an interesting uh, yeah. question, don't you think? I've thought, yeah, I've thought about that as well. And um, I've thought about that as well. And I do kind of agree that, you know, if you were in a kind of environment full of psychopaths, because obviously the general population of the prison is, you know, has there's a high propensity of, of, of there being a, a psychopath present um, exactly. in the population. Uh, mm. So yeah, um, if you're in that kind of environment where there's a lot of violence, um, bullying, you know, even rape and stuff, there's all manner of horrible shit happens in prison. Intimidation, um, you know, people who are drug addicts, you know, trying to steal off you and stuff. Um, yeah, there's all manner of stuff. And obviously there's the, the loneliness. There's all, all. So yeah, it's obviously not a nice place to be. Um, so I do agree with you that in a strange kind of way, if they're killed swiftly um, by um, some kind of lethal injection or whatever the methods are, I'm not really okay with it. Um, maybe they're the ones who get the, the easy way out, you know, because they're not really punished, they're set free. Um, Ex exactly, exactly. But, I, I, I used to think that um, the death penalty was was bad because for all the reasons that we've already said you know that sort of um false imprisonment and that kind of thing however i've watched quite a few um youtube videos recently about what the reality of life in prison is and it sounds like a living hell literally um and to be quite honest given that you know that the continual sort of watching your back and knowing who to trust and um, the potential sort of tinderbox situation that anything could kick off at any moment. And there is no, no let up from this at all, 24 seven. It sounds so stressful and, and horrendous. Death would actually be a release from that suffering. Yeah, um, I hear that, and um, I just, it, it, it's a horrible, um, I can't imagine being in prison, how horrible it would be, but I suppose metaphorically we're all in prison, and we're just in a kind of, uh, what would you call it, open prison, <laughs> you know, um, reality is a bit of a prison, we're imprisoned in our bodies, so we didn't choose our bodies, we didn't prove our, we didn't choose our intellectual capacities, um and yeah we, we were all kind of victims but yeah there's it's it, it kind of there's pros and cons to being in a physical prison uh, you get three meals a day you know there are obviously you don't have to work well you you know you could get lucky and um get a nice 
you know, cellmate or whatever. But, you know, I suppose overall your take your freedoms have been taken away from you. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be there. Um, and, uh, what about you, Wicked? Have you got any uh, viewpoint on prison or um, the death penalty? You're muted, Wicked. I guess Wicked is. I guess Wicked has um, has temporarily um, disappeared. Um, Mark, do you want to ask Elle a question? Um, yeah, I kind of want to riff off of your last thing about prison and how even in prison there can be some goods or uh, some good things that, you know, if you had three squares, me- uh, three square meals and I don't know. Um, in this so-called life prison, where do you derive goods and pleasures? And, you know, what, what are some, because I, I know that in antinatalism, we talk about the negatives and I'm just curious about where people find the positives in their own personal lives. So I'm just curious about that. That question is for you, Al. It's for um, everyone. But yeah. as you're, you might disappear at any moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah firstly, Al. Um, well, I, I guess it depends where you're in prison, doesn't it? Because... Um, the the um the documentaries that i'd watched about it were in american prisons and they just sound absolutely horrendous i mean one three three square meals a day yes but oh sorry i was just mentioning like uh like as a metaphor for life like just life in general like um what what do you find the what are the good things that you find in life for you personally hmm Mm. Well, because we're social animals, the good things in life are always the connections that you make with people. You know, we're we're not we're not designed to be um, isolated, um, and so it's the connections that 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 you make with other people, good connections that you make with other people that. Uh, that are the positives really aren't they do you find i'd yeah, like to think so i i, I hear that but but I think also, it varies per uh, person right that, yeah yeah that it, 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 it depends on your personality some people are introverted and they're quite happy in their own company some people have extreme social anxiety and stuff um you know there are people who are just happy being loners and you know i'm kind of jealous of those people the kind of extreme forms of you know obviously i like my own company um as well but i do like to meet people and talk to people um (laughs) i don't love myself you know unfortunately enough to um (laughs) yeah to 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 kind of uh marry myself and you know live only with myself um yeah i um I, I, but unfortunately, friendship and you know um, striving to connect brings a lot of problems, um, and that to me is, is one of the fundamental issues I have with life is our need to be social, and yet it causes so much pain. Um, it causes so much disappointment, heartbreak, um, mm. even addiction. Like we get addicted to people, we have um, toxic relationships, dysfunctional relationships. Um, and yeah, it, it, there's all these different things going on. Like, can we trust a person? And then people, people's motives can be muddy. They can be malevolent towards us. And yeah, it, there's just so much pain inherent in, in human relationships. And uh, yeah, I, I, I like, I was thinking about what you said, but like, you know, I'll be honest with you, there's only so much I can stomach of everybody. <laughs> and that's including myself. <laughs> um, unfortunately everybody gets on your nerves eventually in some way or other um and it is about having a being able to manage that and that's a very difficult thing to do being able to manage um people in terms of how they're in your life creating boundaries and stuff and there's an element there's an element of selfishness in boundaries because you've got to kind of preserve your own mental health or whatever but then sometimes those boundaries you put up can negatively affect other people and it's just a very difficult 
But isn't isn't the difficulty to form relationships? Um, isn't that one of the reasons that people choose to have children? The reason I say that is because I I had a friend um, in um, when I when I as I was growing up. Um, I had a school friend and she had a child as early as she could because she came from a very difficult background. She came from a very um, neglectful and quite abusive um, family and she was desperate to have a child so that there was another human being in her life who needed her and loved her. And that was her sole reason for having that child. So very selfish. Um, but you know, it is obviously someone who's been psychologically damaged, so we can't be too hard on her. Uh, exactly. You can um, you, you could understand her her reasons. You know, she wasn't thinking long term, she was literally thinking in the short term, she desperately needed somebody that would be there for her. So you can kind of see yeah. why, you know, given that it's so difficult to connect with with someone that you can sort of form a relationship with and to, you know, you can love and trust. Um, that's how she solved that problem by having a child. Why do you think in, why do you think people in today's society have a difficult time connecting with others? Or at least some people, at least. Well, um, um, I think that. Sorry, I'll, I'll let Elle speak. Well, no. If if you if you've got a point to make, then then you carry on because uh, I I need to give okay. that some. Well, I, <laughs> I just, need to give that some thought. Yeah, I I just think um, we're kind of um, living in this age nowadays where we have this kind of uh, ability to, you know, connect with others online. And um, I don't know how, it's obviously good in some ways because you can reach out and find, you know, um, like-minded people. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, um, there's dangers in that, which I won't you know, go into too much, but obviously the danger is we all form these little echo chambers and, you know, stay in our houses and just, you know, don't really open our minds to any other um, uh, opinions. We, we kind of seek the kind of easy way through life by finding people who agree with us and, you know, just finding, sitting in our comfort zone without having to um, go outside of it. And I think that's dangerous for society um, because it, it, it creates even more separation um, in a bizarre way that, you know, we, we, we've never been so more connected, but there's never been the potential for, um, <laughs> such uh, difference in humanity because you can really magnify and uh, you know increase the the, the kind of uh, numbers of people who are opposed to each other and you, know, you can have more more amounts of people in little cliques uh, and because there's more amounts of people those people can form subcultures and you know depend on each other and you know use each other for their kind of uh, whatever they need you know stimulation into conversation, I suppose even relationships. So in a kind of way, we're moving away from unity. We're moving more towards separation. And um, but yeah, other than that, you know, we are living in the age of pure narcissism, I suppose, in a way, um, in that, you know, you go online and it's all people pouting, you know, um, people showing off their biceps and everybody's trying to be um, you know, America's next model, top model. Um, and it's, it's extremely superficial. There's lots of kind of, I would say, soft porn on some of these Instagram sites and stuff. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very kind of, inst it's like instant gratification. People are looking and they're being tempted by the way someone looks and, and there's not as much, the deepness, the humanity isn't there. I don't think in, in a lot of these um, kind of, in, in the main, I would say ma the main amount of these kind of social interactions online are quite superficial. I mean, if you go on TikTok, it's 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 kind of ridiculous. Uh, the level of thought that goes on, it's just 
still in us, really. And uh, it's just, you know, a lot of single mothers lip syncing to crap songs. And there's, I don't know what else is going on. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm rambling and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up there because I, I just think that the internet is doing weird stuff to, to our ability to connect. And um, in another kind of way, it's making us feel even more disconnected because we're seeing people put on phony facades. Uh, we're seeing people, you know, displaying all the good times and happy times, and, you know, that they're, they're saying life is great and they're smiling. And, you know, you think everybody else is having a fantastic time on this hell rock. Um, and, mm. but then you find out, you know, six months later, they've killed themselves or something, or they have depression. So the, 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 um, what I'm saying is the facade, the front of people are putting out there isn't real, isn't genuine, uh, or it's, or it's narcissistic and it's dangerous. It's, 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 it's making people feel depressed. It's making people feel alienated and different. And, um, yeah, th th there's a lot of work being put into this, um, but I don't know what the solution is. So I'm just going to shut up now. So Mark, go ahead. Oh, I was just asking. I... No, you, you've hit. Do you, do you, you have hit, an opinion? You, sorry. Go ahead. Oh. I was going to say you you've really hit on something there, haven't you? That because we are so hyper connected with so many people, but the level and the quality of that connection is so so limited and so superficial. That's the difference. We have the illusion of being connected to people. But it's not the connection yeah. that we that we crave. It's not the connection that we need because it has no um, no reality to it. it. Has no depth to it. Well, you know, um, what I'll say is I just want to reiterate what I said. Like, yeah, the vast amount of interactions online is extremely superficial. I would say um, some of my antinatalist connections, I have deep, meaningful connections with them. But the danger, I'm, the, what I'm talking about on a societal level, um, you'll see people who have like ide ideologies or philosophies on life um, or even theologies, uh, the theological thoughts, and they'll like um, migrate towards those people online. So you might have like LGBT people, BLM people, um, you know, uh, right wing people, left wing people, environmentalists, um, whatever, um, whatever your interest is feminism, whatever it is. And people have the ability now to connect with thousands of people, like-minded people online. So whilst the vast majority of interactions online are extremely superficial, there are some very meaningful things going on. But unfortunately, they're going on in a kind of clandestine manner. They're going on in like an echo chambers, hidden from kind of view. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of creating subcultures, you know, that aren't interacting uh, with 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 you know the the mainstream uh and it's i i don't know like obviously it's important i'm not saying it's not important i'm not saying we shouldn't connect with each other but i'm just saying as a fatalistic person as someone who's pessimistic i worry um about that as a kind of um impact on humanity as a whole like are, are we differentiating ourselves even more moving more and more towards um you know uh away from each other you know Again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just kind of and kind of illuminating that what I think. If that, it, if it makes isn't, sense, isn't that another reason why um, people choose to have children? Because yeah, you, know, you, you th mentioned is, that earlier. Yeah, I mean, there's. The, I'm just thinking another reason that people have children is because obviously. Um, there's the 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 kind of relationships that we crave are ones which are physical and that doesn't necessarily mean sexual it just means just to be loved by somebody and to be held by someone and if you bond with a child that is such a pure such a pure relationship isn't it Yeah, it is. In terms of, you know, obviously I remember being a child and you do love your parents. Um, well, hopefully. I mean, obviously some people have uh, terrible experiences and stuff, but, you know, obviously in a kind of um, 
it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome. You know, you come out <laughs> and you, you end up in this world and there's these people fawning over you and uh, there's hormones involved. There's oxytocin and, mm. you know, there's all these feelings where, you know, you, you haven't got verbal capacity, you haven't got verbal reasoning, you haven't even got intellectual uh, ability to any great degree. So you've got these people looking after you and making you feel safe in a way, uh, feeding you and all these things. So, yeah, you do. You, you do kind of fall in love with these people, so to speak. Um, and it is a natural thing to, you know, feel close to your to your parents. And uh, yeah, and, but it's not chosen. It's not of your own free will. Um, and yeah, but it is a reason people do this to stop the loneliness. And that is a, that is uh, something people throw at antenatalists. That oh, you're, when you get old, you're going to be so lonely because you're not going to have any children or grandchildren coming to see you. Uh, how do you feel about that, um, people? As a kind of uh, Common, a common utterance like that is, is, is kind of used to, 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 to talk down to Antinope. Mark? Um, I know plenty of people with big families that their families don't come to see them near the end of their life. So I don't think it matters that you have these genetic connections with people. I think that connection... Um, uh, with with even with or without uh, that blood connection matters um so i know people with a uh, strong um family con uh sorry friendship connections that their friends will come see them near the end of the life and i think that's my goal is that um you know i have uh, some strong connections uh with my friends and near the end of my life that they'll come see me and i won't die alone can i ask what what age range you are not specifically how old you are but I'm 35. Uh, what, oh, okay. The reason I ask that is because um, I think these feelings become more um, more real the older you get. <laughs> you know, we we change as as we get older. We and we face our mortality. Um, you know we can actually see that we're not going to live forever i think it does start to change your viewpoint the reason i say that is because when i was in my 30s i didn't think about it but now i'm later in my life i think hmm yeah he's going to look after me <laughs> and i do think that i don't regret not having children but i do start to wonder and worry about not that I won't have friends, but who is going to care for me and who's going to make sure that I'm cared for in, you know, in a hospital or in a hospice or, you know, who's going to advocate for me, I yeah. think, you know. Yeah, but you, you, I understand what you're saying. And that's why I think it's important for antenatalists to try and build up strong friendship bases and even have relationships um, if, if, if they can. I mean, like a romantic relationship, um, you know, try, try and get people into their lives who, who they can look after and, and, and it's reciprocated, you know, it's, it's kind of, that's a wonderful thing when there's no like blood, but yet people care deeply about each other. I think that's beautiful, mm. you know, because mm. it's chosen. It's almost like the purest form of, um, you know, love, I suppose, when people choose to do it. Um, so... It is something maybe antenatalists have to think about, you know, and prepare for is, is old age. But, you know, if, if, if you live in the West, you know, there is an, an element of uh, social care. And if you've paid into the system and even if you're disabled, there is hopefully something in your country to help you. And I've been in the hospital for like I remember um, years ago, I was in uh, an accident and I was in the hospital <laughs> with uh, broken bones and stuff. And um, I was lying in bed and there was this man I, I was in this little ward right mini ward because the, the hospital was so um jam-packed with um you know people that patients that, that we were moved to this kind of side ward and i'll never forget it because there was this um old man and he was very old and he was in absolute agony um he had family you know but they're working and they used to very very, very rarely come in to see him um but he used to be crying out in agony and pain and he was scared shitless and you know he had his um catero on so he's peeing into a bag and he had a kind of colost colostomy bag or something you know where they peep into a bag as well mm -hmm. um 
and he could barely move and he was always yelling out with pain. I don't know what was wrong with the man, but that scared the shit out of me. He, he was quite an old man, very old man, but um, he, he kind of lost his mind a bit, was in extreme physical pain and he was crying out for help. Um, and the nurses were ignoring him half the time because they were overworked and stuff. And, you know, I, I, I didn't particularly like those nurses. I do generally have much respect, a lot of respect for nurses because I think anybody who chooses to do that job, you know, has to be highly commended um, for the most part um, if they're doing it for kind of reasons where they want to look after people. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful that we have people who choose to do that. Um, and unfortunately, they're not paid enough, you know, for, for what they do. Um, but yeah, what I'm, all I'm saying is the man didn't have a great time. He was having a terrible time and he had family. <laughs> so there's no guarantee that just because you have family that, you know, it's going to be okay or that um, everything is going to be hunky-dory. And the other thing is, um, you know, you're, you're just kicking the, the problem to someone else because if you have children and you're worried about, oh, I'm worried that I'm, because I don't have children, um, I might be lonely when I die and, and you know, I might have a terrible time uh, alone, my bed shit or whatever it is. Well, all you're doing is passing this potential problem to somebody else when you have a child because the same shit could happen to them, you know? Um, so if this is the way you're thinking, well, what is it really an act of love for you to create someone who, who then has to face that same possible, you know, dilemma and problem? I mean, the fact that you're thinking about this as an issue and then you're creating somebody who may well have to experience that themselves, it's not an act of love. It's, it's not a good thing to create them, is it? Absolutely. It's, a, it's an act of fear, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I oh, you're back. Wow. Yeah, sorry, man. Um, sorry. I didn't mean to go there. It's my well, dad I suppose it is news. good. It is Good Friday and people do like people do go missing on Good Friday and don't come back for a few days. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, sorry about that. My uh, my dad got a text message. Uh, he was spending time with someone and they've got the coronavirus, you know, and he was spending time with them. So he's going to have to go get tested. And we were talking about it. Right. Right. OK. Well, um, yeah, I hope everything's OK. Um, by the way, this has been recorded. You do know that, folks. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, and it will go on the channel. Um, yeah. Coronavirus. Well, we didn't we, we didn't talk about that, but uh, not a nice way to go. But is, is is there any is there any nice way to go? What, what what's your feelings, folks, on the um, coronavirus and the measures being put in place to try and uh, prevent its uh, spread amongst humans? Uh, L, would you like to go first thing as you're in danger of disappearing at any moment? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go very soon, I think. Um I don't really have any views on coronavirus, I don't think. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um wicked. Actually, before well, you, you know, go, like can I ask a couple of questions to L? Sure. Yeah. Um. So you were a lifelong uh, antinatalist, but how did you find out about the philosophy itself, like the term and um, popular arguments for it? Do you know, I don't actually remember how I discovered it. Um, may have been on YouTube. I find most things on YouTube. Um, I, I, I honestly can't remember even how long ago I discovered that this is a philosophy but as soon as I heard about it I thought oh yeah that's that describes how I feel about things you know and how do you feel about the other schools of thought within the anti-procreative umbrella um like the child free In... movement or other uh, movements that are sort of Talking about procreation. How do I feel about them? I, I yeah, do just... you have any opinions on them? Um, like child free, child. They don't. They don't necessarily say that um, creating life is um, you know selfish or is morally wrong. 
like child free people just celebrate not having children. So how do you feel about that? So, I, I mean, I, I must admit, I don't know anything about the child free movement, but is it, it, are they saying that they are child free for selfish reasons that they don't, they just don't want children and they prefer life without children or what's, what's their reasoning? Um, from what I gather, it's, uh, yeah, they just want the freedom to, uh, the one good thing about that movement is that they're, they're pushing against, um, traditional gender roles and, um, you know, they, they want their choice of being child-free respected and the advantages of living a child-free life, uh, articulated as well. Um, so to offer alternative choices, the, but what about like the voluntary human extinction movement or, um, have you heard of, uh, like the, uh, what, what else is there, like ethelism, or uh, I don't know, is there, what, what else am I missing? I feel like I'm missing some others. Um, that's more or less it, I suppose. Um, but that's more or less it. Um, have you heard of ethelism, Mel, where people talk about wanting to um, end uh, all life on, on the planet, like uh, basically, you know, end all animal life, end all human life? Uh, yeah, the the whole sort of, by, yeah. the, the red whole, button argument. Yeah, I was going to say the whole red button argument. Yeah, I mean, if if I had a red button, I would press it. <laughs> Let's put it that way, because I I I see I I I I worry about so many things. I just have to see sort of you know. The life surrounding me in my own garden and I worry about it I worry about them all and I just would like to put an end to all of that suffering you know just sort of prevent any suffering from happening so I absolutely would press the red button no doubt about it okay but the, so there's about, the like how do you follow uh like these types of groups or is it just mostly the antinatalism groups that you follow? I don't really follow any groups. It's just okay. a, it's just a view that I have and yeah. I am interested in it. I'm not, um, it's not a big part of my life. What is a big part of your life? Getting through the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just getting through the day. And what sort of hobbies do you have? What sort of uh, things other than uh, we mentioned, like the, the benefit of connection? Is there um, into reading movies, something? I, get, I tell you that the main the main thing in my life is is protecting the life around me. That's what preoccupies me. Um, I have a garden mm -hmm. which is teeming with life. Um, and that's what gives me pleasure. I, I feed the birds, I protect them, I, I give them nest materials, I provide a habitat for them. You know, that's, that's what really, it's, it's like a mini nature reserve. Yeah. So that I want, I want my, the space that I own in this, in this world, on this planet, to be as protective and welcoming as it as it can be so and that's what gives me pleasure okay yeah yeah i mean i i i i i am um, you know try to help um wildlife as and when i can but you know i can't help but worry like <laughs> like would i be better off um you know paving over uh, my garden um you know preventing uh, environment preventing habitat um, for um, any sentient animals, you know, one less place for them to give birth. Um, mm. and that, that, that's a terrible thought, you know, it's not a nice thought, it's not nice to have these thoughts, it's not an enjoyable thought to have when you think, oh, you know, that's, a, that's the problem with reality, everything you do has a, has a potential negative effect, like when I'm feeding the birds, you know, I might be creating a monster who will go and kill a few other birds next year during, you know, competition for mating or whatever, or, you know, or I might be feeding a bird who'll lay 
some eggs and then a cat will come along and chew their heads off or something. You, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, you can get like a, a type oh, of... It's so frustrating. You get like an analysis paralysis of trying to understand all the potential branches of like a butterfly effect of every single thing that you do. But at least yeah. you're taking into consideration other non-human animals. And I think that's commendable. Not a lot of people do that. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it is something I think that is a pressing um, matter, like the suffering of wild animals. I, I spoke about this before. Um, but, you know, the fact that, you know, basically chimpanzees are our cousins. You know, I mean, they, 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 they have this kind of minuscule difference in their DNA to us. I think it's less than 2% or something. And um, <laughs> how the fuck can we live in a world where we know that they're like feeding the crap out of each other? They're so strong they can rip each other's heads off and limbs off. And they do do that. They're, very, they're a murderous species. They gang up on each other. They bully each other. They're really, really horrible to each other. And I'm not blaming them for that because obviously it's not their fault. That's just the way this fucker called nature uh, created them. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something I feel very strongly about. We should be trying to help these animals you know, out of their plight because even the fucking like alpha males, even like the silverbacks uh, in gorillas and you know, even the alpha males in, in some of these places, they eventually get beaten down and chewed up and, you know, they get cancer, they get all these horrible problems as well. So there's no winners in nature. So it is something I, I feel we do have to find a solution to. Um, but I'm not sure. I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, <laughs> uh, ethelism sounds like the answer, but the problem is, for me, is the consent of other human beings. Like You just cannot get that. And to me, that's why it falls. Um, you can't get human beings to agree to stop breeding let alone you know annihilate the ones who won't agree so and i don't think we should do that you know um so that's why um it fails from me mm. i do think we should be pushing animal suffering in the wild um, and i don't know how we'll, we'll get get rid of that i don't know if we'll be, ever be able to have a situation where um you know we limit the limit the existence of uh, carnivores for example because uh, even that won't solve anything because there'll still be you know starvation and stuff and you know you know there'll still be um explosions in population with more herbivores uh, for example to get cancer or you know to get injured or to get like hurt themselves in in their mating kind of um struggles you know you know during you know rutting season or whatever for deer etc um so I don't know what the answer is. All I know is it's hellish. <laughs> El, how did you find uh, Anthony Ellis Outreach's channel? Hmm, that's a good good question. Um, I have no idea how I discovered it, or even when. Can you even remember how long ago it it, it would have been when I uh, discovered you? Um, I do remember. You you follow me on Twitter, uh, but I didn't figure out that you're somebody who commented on my channel until like a long time after that. And I think it's because you called yourself L on both of them. Yes, um, but I found I believe you on you YouTube. Made, you made a, I can't remember. Yeah, you did. But you made a comment, a, a kind of, uh, I suppose it was disagreeing with me on something or, you know, I can't remember what it was, but you made this kind of really quite angry comment, actually. <laughs> and I think I replied to it in it. It, it it made me like oh I'm gonna to reply to that and I think I made an upload replying to it uh, and yeah, I think I th from I, that I, you contacted I, me on Twitter. I think I can't um, remember what it was about. In your, I remember in your reply video you pretty much said fuck you. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> I just did. Uh, well, you just did. You just did. But that's very unparliamentary <laughs> language. And uh, yeah, um, I uh, well, I, I, I don't know. Do, do, do you remember what it was I was saying um, F you about? Because I, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. It made me laugh. I remember that. <laughs> well, there you go. See, even in animosity, uh, friendships can be born. So exactly, yeah, that, that's good. Exactly, <laughs> all, that, is, that, that, all is not lost. But all that is, was <laughs> all is not lost from speaking your truth. All is exactly. not lost from having you know strong opinions. 
<laughs> that was that was when I thought, yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> Got a good sense okay. of humor. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'd like to see you two talking, Wicked and and L, uh, and kind of I'd like to sit back and be lazy and just listen to you guys. So, uh, would you like to talk to each other, Wicked? Ask L a question, anything that pops up. Just one just quick question for a bit, and we'll butt in. One quick question because I am going to have okay. to go because I'm going to have to try and fix my um, my phone charger so that my phone doesn't die completely. All right. Okay, well, it turns out Wicked is, is not, Wicked is gone. Oh, <laughs> no, all right. I'm here. Uh, well, was, I'm here. Oh, did you, you have that question? Do you have any questions for Al? Wicked? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, not really. Um, uh, what well, do you think that antinatalism will become more and more popular in the future? Hmm. It's it's so alien to most people. I I can't I can't really. Things I think things would have to change quite a lot for people to um, accept it as a philosophy. Sure, that's sure. A, that's an interesting question. I mean, what what would have to change to make yeah. it a more palatable philosophy? Do you think? This is a question to, to all of you. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I guess uh, the presentation, you know, like, I mean, uh, we, you know, some of the presentation from like Commendum or Superhuman Dance is very aggressive, you know, um, and that can be necessary, but I guess more like memes and comic books and more integration in media and films and stuff like that. Uh, like what River Road Films uh, has done on, on her channel. I guess maybe more of that in media. Yeah, um, it would be good if um, people, you know, presented their stuff in a more <laughs> palatable way for the masses. But unfortunately, the most most people are morons, so it is it's difficult to <laughs> know what the fuck to say. Um, oh, it, we, it really is difficult, isn't it? Um, but you know it's a bit like what we were talking about earlier if, if you are yourself uh, you will you will attract people so kind of the more people we get into it and the more people are themselves hopefully they'll attract others just by being themselves i i, I don't know but that's the hope and um, what about you mark have you got any um answers for for wicked's question um i don't know if i have a a good opinion on this i'm quite critical of the antinatalism movement or community in general I think about uh, you know like creates like or or attracts like and and if you're if it's a lot of um, misanthropic attitudes without the philanthro like without the philosophy in there uh, acknowledging the hurt of others if it's just like I hate humans or I hate babies and I hate parents and I want to promote that idea I think that could be quite toxic um, and I would appeal to people to. Um, look towards their compassion, their empathy, and sympathize with others, and recognize that we're all in this hell together, and um, try to mitigate the suffering uh, that we all face. So to, um, um, it's an appeal to kindness, yeah. to just try and be freaking kind to each other. Do you think it would be worthwhile, like, differentiating yourself then more, even more, like, like, maybe calling yourself a philanthropic antinatalist? Anytime people ask you, like, should I call myself philanthropic? Oh, dude, like, I've, I mean, do you think that I've tried to call myself a sentiocentric, benetarian, philanthropic, antinatalist? Nobody knows what that means. Like, the unless you, <laughs> unless say like positive you, antinatalist. what's that? Just, just say positive antinatalism, you know, you know, if you have negative utilitarianism, <laughs> have positive antinatalism. <laughs> I don't like, know. This is the thing. Complicated. Is there a problem with the word? Is there a problem with the word? I don't know. I I I think the word's okay, but do you think we need to develop a term specifically to kind of uh, elaborate what you mean, Mark? Like that? It's uh, about love. It's about compassion, empathy. 
I don't know. We keep creating new terms. I don't know if that's going to help or not. Maybe. I don't know. I, I don't know the solution. <laughs> I, I just okay. noticed that, you know, okay. there's... Uh, I just would like to see more open dialogue um, and um, compassionate, uh, nonviolent communication between people. But maybe okay. I'm being a hippie or something. Well, Mark, I think you've you've hit you've hit on a really good point actually there's just two things I'd, I'd like to say before I go um one thing is that as I say I think it's 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 fear that makes people want to have children as I say because they want to have somebody during their um, everyday life that they feel that connected to and and safe with and supported by so following from your point, I think as a society, we just need to get better at creating a family unit, but without having a family, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So that we yeah. connect with other people who are already living and get that sense of community and safety and security and trust. So we don't need to have children. And then the, the, the other f main fear is, is when we get old or when we get ill or when we get towards the end of our life, to know that there will be somebody there for us. And if we can somehow as a society um, assuage those fears for each other, then the need to have children will will be less if you see what i mean because mm. we won't need to have a child to to fulfill yeah. those do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah that's a great point it reminds yeah, me of the interim studio it sounds like we need to sorry go on it sounds like we need to it sounds like we need to as antinatalists if we can if we have the ability to it sounds like we need to pull our sleeves up in society and you know try and fix these areas that will help us in our goals so yeah make sure that you know the rights of the elderly um and the vulnerable are um are being um you know, looked into and and and, and re recognized as important so yeah maybe that's something we should advocate for more uh and yeah it's a very good point so sorry wicked I'm going to have to go anyway. Okay, guys, but it's been great talking. It was nice talking to you. You, you too. Bye, okay. Ellie. Hopefully, we'll talk to you again. Bye now. Yeah. Take Bye. care. Bye. 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 What was I saying about oh, Wicked? Conundrum you were saying something. Did a video. Oh, Conundrum did a video recently in response to Gary, which is we should help the poor, we should help people. And that reduces the amount that they reproduce and that's true across a bunch of countries that he gave examples for um in the video his response to gary um i don't know if you guys saw that i saw it that was, it was a while ago but yeah i saw that i thought yeah, it's similar to what I was a good saying. point yeah well it I is true i mean if you if you help yeah if you do help the poor um you know you give them access to um funds so they're not living and they're not living hand to mouth. They're not worried where you know, their next meal is coming from. Um, well, if, yeah. if you give them, you know, a standard of living, well, then they can work on other, you know, matters like education. And that obviously brings um, benefits to society as a whole. And also, it's clearly shown time and time again that in developed countries where women are educated, the birth rates are dropping. So obviously, yeah, very important. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Wicked, you were going to say? Oh, no, I was just like the, the term nonviolent communication. I mean, that's such an important thing that uh, I've just discovered recently, and I haven't really uh, been working enough on that, but that's uh, an awesome thing. I, I, I need to check out that book. I think it's Michael, Michael Rosenberg. Is that, is that it, Mer? I forgot the name. I, I haven't heard of this. I haven't heard of this. Um, it sounds interesting. So nonviolent communication. Um, yeah. Can you, book, either yeah. of you give a brief, can you either of you briefly describe what that entails? 
Well, normally when we communicate, um, we don't communicate our needs. You know, we end up in arguments. You, we communicate our emotion and our anger and rage and, and that kind of thing. And we don't communicate in a way that helps deal with the underlying issues that upset people in the first place. And we end up kind of driving a wedge between each other and because we don't talk about things. We don't really get a lot of truths out there, you know, um, that would mm. simple conversations could really dramatically improve our lives. Mm. Yeah, um, so unfortunately, a lot of um, conversations, a lot of conversations on important matters uh, deteriorate into point scoring. And, but I don't know yeah. how that can ever be remediated when people do have opposing views, people do have you know psychologies compelling them. Uh, to think in certain ways and sometimes they think in such ways that they find other people's ways detestable or even you know dangerous um so it's, it's again it's, it's a beautiful beautiful notion that you know we should aspire to these things but you know unfortunately i, I see it as failing when you look at when you go on twitter when you go online when you go on social media and you see the way humans behave to each other with opposing views it's it's it's, it's deplorable well, um, yeah, that's a, but again, that's, it's not. Sorry. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm not saying we shouldn't aspire to that. I'm not saying we shouldn't aspire to that. I and mean, that is good. And, and it is something that maybe you know, right-minded people have to lead the way and say, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, talk in a non-violent way or non non-threatening way. I'm going to try and put my points across in a way that's not going to hurt or intimidate people. Um, it's a big task. Definitely. That's what I'm saying. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I just wanted to say, like, I wasn't sure if you were having, like, um, feeling defeated in the goal of doing that. But, like, that's something that I am happy that I can dialogue with people that I feel are dangerous. Like, I feel like their ideas can be dangerous. Um, for example, um, I think it's dangerous uh, for people to... Um, if you tr actively try to, or you hold the position that, um, you know, uh, gay people shouldn't be married or that, um, uh, uh, I don't know, um, abortion shouldn't be uh, legalized, uh, uh, medical assistance and dying shouldn't happen, um, it, or if you're against promortalism or for promortalism or, if you're an antinatalist or if you're an ethylist and so like I can go on and on and on um but we should like when I think about all the conversations I've had I've had those conversations with a whole array of people and at the end of the day I can still continue that dialogue forward without um without just shutting them down and not um finding that communicative bridge um so I I feel like that's a that's an important thing to facilitate and to aspire to. And I think we need more of that. Um, personally, at least anecdotally, personally, I'm just tired of people shouting at each other and not having any constructive dialogue. So that's what I've been seeing a lot, especially yeah. I feel like YouTube kind of uh, encourages that in a weird way. Yeah. A spectacle, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, very interesting what you just said there, Mark. And um, yeah. I, I, I agree, as I said, it's, it's important that we do lead the way, people do lead the way in communicating in an effective and, you know, uh, in, in a way that's, uh, I suppose, morally good. Um, so, yeah, I suppose it's, a, it's, it's, it's an endeavour, it's, it's a worthy cause to, to be involved in. Um, and I suppose it is holding yourself correctly. Um, I suppose that comes down to philosophical questions as to what is correct. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is holding yeah, yeah. <laughs> yourself correctly, but it, it, it's, it's very complicated. And this is the problem of being human. Things sound, I, we have these idealistic notions, but they're very complicated. Um, you know, superficially it sounds good, but then when you go into it, it's, it's muddy, you know, it's gray. There's no clear cut answers to what is the right course of action. And, you know, when we are, faced with another human being, you know, acting in a certain way towards us, you know, what do we do? You know, if someone act, if someone is shouting at you, calling you names, insulting you, yes, I, I believe that the best thing to do online 
is to act in a calm manner back to them and, and you know, not rise to, to, to their way of being. Or walk away. Um, um, I've noticed that some people, or, or when walk they... Away. Yeah, in real life... In, in, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. In, in real life, I, I would say walk away. But online, you know, you have the benefit of, you know, the protection of, you know, not being in that person's physical vicinity. So I would say, if you can, give a parting shot in terms of, leave them with uh, a thought and it, like it may not be that, that they will read that thought and think oh wow it may be that others reading it will see the sensibleness of what you're saying so i would say try your best to leave uh, information there for others to read before you leave so don't just like you know leave on a cliff edge and let them have the last say try and leave something you know some information there for others to read before you disappear <laughs> sorry go ahead I was just going to say, like, I've noticed that in some debate culture on YouTube that some people create a list or they just they shame people for walking away. And I don't think there's any shame in walking away of asserting your boundaries when someone is insulting you and uh, shouting at you or whatever. I think it's it's a matter of self-respect to say you've pushed the limit. I'm walking away now. And if you want to continue to engage, then these are the boundaries. And I think that's completely uh, a good thing to do. So that's one thing that I'd like to see a little bit more of um, within the, at least in the debate community, um, instead of shaming people for being whatever, uh, cowards or um, just because like someone can outshout someone else, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, it, it, it's become like a ballroom brawl or like drunkards <laughs> on some of these debate pro kind of channels, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just, it's just Neanderthal really um, <laughs> in terms of, well, I, I don't like to, I don't like to be mean to Neanderthals. I don't quite know what they are like, but <laughs> it, basically it's become brutish, um, you know, and um, yeah, not, not pleasant. So yeah, that, that's, that, I agree with you there. Well, one thing I want to um, go back on, hopefully, sorry, could, uh, is the, um, the thing about echo chambers, like you don't want to be in an echo chamber. When I reflect upon all the communities that yeah. have been a part of, say, the atheist community or the vegan community or the anti nihilist community, I've noticed that, yeah, like you want to you want to expose yourself to new ideas. But I've noticed that every single group that I've been a part of has a, a wide array of political leanings or uh, ethical uh, deviations. And um I mean, just in the antinatalist world, right? We have so many different schools of thought. And so I don't know, it, like, is it possible to have just a pure echo chamber? Because I feel like no matter where you go, you'll, you'll always find a diversity of thought. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that is a good point. There is always uh, some element of friction somewhere. And we, we as human beings, we, we're going around with these personalities and these frailties that are you know we're, we're like a, a we're like a fruit machine like you when we're born you pull the lever and we come out you don't know what's going to come up on that bar is it, is it going to be three lemons or is it going to be a gold bar a bunch of two bunch of grapes <laughs> you know you don't know how someone's going to turn out and although we may have a passion in one area we might be you know we might also have you know views or different in, in other areas and um, that that is, you know, we, we see that in our community with uh, varying matters. For example, poor people, trans people, um, disabled people. Um, there are some people who have very strange views to me, you know. Um, um, and yeah, but I suppose the more you communicate, the more likely it is that you will find those echo chambers. And then uh, I kind of do have a few people I talk to um, regularly. I am somewhat aligned to, um, but I have to check myself really and, you know, realize that I should also be talking to others who aren't aligned to me um, because that's where change happens. Yep. <laughs> Was there any other topics um, or... Uh... You can... uh I think coronavirus. Yeah, came well, up, didn't oh, it? yeah, coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, I think you're asking me about it. Uh, I guess I'm not a virologist, so I don't know much about that stuff. 
I mean, it seems like it wasn't handled very well early on. You know, there's, you know, some uh, miscommunication about like it's spreading from person to person. And, uh, you know, it seems like it, uh, you know, spread to Europe and spread to, you know, other countries around the world, like, uh, you know, um, and I guess people didn't know the there basics. Seems to be, you're right. There's, 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 there seems to be kind of like they seem to give um, advice one day and then retract it the next day and give the opposite advice. They seem, yeah, seem we, to we, say things like, oh, face masks mask won't hurt. Face masks won't yeah. help. Face masks are necessary. You, you, you only need one meter. Oh, no, you need to stay two meters away from each other. Um, you know, yeah, and then you then meet groups turns, yeah. Oh, no, you can only meet groups for one. Yeah. And then it also, the advice had consequences. So it was like, okay, now we're a mask. Okay, now you can't wear masks because doctors don't have any masks anymore. We're not producing enough protective equipment. So they're giving advice and then not mm -hmm. producing a situation where you could even follow the advice. And there wasn't yeah. enough information. My, my main worry throughout, my main worry throughout all of this um, pandemic has been vulnerable people. Um, who perhaps didn't have the intellectual capacity to even understand the instructions, you know, because you know, bad enough having some kind of learning difficulty um, without, you know, they, they could go online and they could read advice, you know, and, and, and then not have the, 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 you know, the gumption to check the next day to see if it's changed. Uh, it, it, it was a, it was very difficult for a lot of people to navigate. It's very difficult for me to actually navigate policy yeah. and see what the hell you were being told to do. So, you know, when you realise the average IQ, not that I'm a fan of IQ, but when you realise the average IQ is 100, that means 50% of the people are below that. My God, um, it's a terrible state of affairs um, that we can't give a clear, concise message to the populace, you know, uh, as to Definitely. what is yeah. the best course of action to take. Um, I, I find it terrible, you know. Um, I've also been a bit disappointed um, with, funny enough, someone threatened to stab me today, guys. Oh, shit. <laughs> I, went into, uh, into, um, I went into a cafe. I went into a cafe, and there was two guys uh, in their 20s, and there was an elderly lady behind me. And they weren't wearing masks, and they were kind of, uh, the two, two young guys, and they were kind of standing near her, and um, they... Uh, coughing and shouting and you know creating all kinds of hullabaloo and I was kind of going out and I did say to look guys that you should be wearing masks I know you know you might not have it but just to get people some kind of uh, elderly people uh, put them at ease because a lot of people are worried about this you know and these guys oh what the fuck are you going to do about it you know <laughs> and uh, I did say oh well what are you going to do about it I, I was a bit riled up um, and um, then one of them ran into the cafe kitchen to go and get a knife he said i'll show you and he ran into the kitchen to try and get a knife and to be honest with you i left because um yeah i just i didn't have anything on me i don't, I don't want to get in, in, i don't want to get i walked away we talked about this earlier i walked away uh i felt a bit annoyed walking away because i know i knew physically i could have had him and his friend but um the point is uh he, he did he was going to get a knife and i, I didn't need to be around you know I didn't need to put myself into that situation, so yeah, I did. I didn't. I did leave uh, the premises. It seemed like you, you um, were also well, what I'm saying is, person. sorry, sorry, go on. sorry, say that again. Go I was, uh, say, yeah, I was thinking about him because he was. A, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I was. I, I, like, I, I, afterwards, when I walked away, I was thinking, you know what? He was like 23 or whatever he was. You know, the brain's not fully formed. He's obviously highly, you know, agitated, hormonal, full of testosterone, and not thinking straight. And he wasn't yeah. thinking straight because he acted completely seemed violently and aggressive towards me straight away, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it, it's just an example of, um, you know, unfortunately of living amongst humans. These things happen when you live amongst humans. Um, you try to have civil interaction. You try to put your point across and you're met with um, anger. Um, you're met with, you can be ridiculed in some circumstances for just giving your opinion. You can be bullied, harassed, uh, isolated, ostracized. All manner of things can happen to you for sharing your opinion. Um, so, in that regard, be an anti Don't, don't, don't play risk. Don't put someone into a world where, you know, them having a 
just trying to have a civilized conversation or put their point across in a civilized manner <laughs> is going to cause them harm. Yeah. I mean, sort of here with that guy trending you, man. Like that's that's not really uncalled for, you know. I mean, that's I've had that quite, happen quite a lot in 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 life in terms of like I remember once I was walking out of uh, McDonald's because um, I went in to use the toilet and I walked out there and there was these um two again guys in their twenties and they should have known better and th there was like this homeless guy who was like schizophrenic sitting outside the he was quite you know you'd see him quite regularly he talks to himself and stuff and he was sitting outside and he looked very disheveled and stuff um and these guys had him and they were videoing him with their phone laughing at him on i don't know whether it was on instagram or tiktok or whatever and um i did get angry i walked by i said put that phone away you little shit i said you should be trying to help him not ridicule him. and um you know of course, they got in my face and they were like, oh, what are you saying? You know, yeah. and one of them goes, you're lucky I'm not, I'm on, I'm on license because I'd fucking do you. Obviously, I, I said, well, what type of license is that? Dog license? Because you're a fucking bitch. <laughs> it, was just, it just came out of me. Not, not a good thing to say. <laughs> not a good thing to say at the time. Not a good thing to say at the time, given the kind of circumstances. But I sure, have sure. really got to try and control, like, I really have got to check myself because, you know, these people are dangerous these people are like they're not the full shilling they're willing to kill you for nothing you know people get stabbed yeah. people get murdered um for absolutely fucking nothing people get life-changing injuries people get acid thrown in their face people get like you know they're whatever like stabbed in the lungs stabbed, yeah. in, stabbed in the stomach you know it's a scary fucking world and i do have to check myself i do have to say stop doing that but Unfortunately with me, I can't help myself when someone is doing something shit to others. I do, unfortunately, I don't know. I just feel instantly triggered. <laughs> so I do yeah. want to say something. I do want to get involved trying to try and stop it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what to say about that. It's just very difficult to exist. <laughs> yeah, we need yeah. new evidence-based ways to deal with young people who are aggressive. Yeah, And even anyone who is violent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think you're right. We've uncovered a new vein of conversation here, but the kind of boisterous nature of young men, um, teenagers and, and young men, um, who, you know, go around committing random acts of violence, you know, and you know, they don't have the, 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 the kind of, their brain's not well developed. They don't, they, you can't really blame them because it is, part, unfortunately, it's part and parcel of, you know, young men. They do terrible things to other human beings. <laughs> they laugh yeah, at them, yeah. they point at them, because they don't know the kind of consequences of what they're doing. They bully them, they point at the they point at the freak and you know make the person feel terrible and um, call them free. I don't like that word, but I'm just using that word because that's the type of word they use. Um sure. they'll attack people. You know, I remember growing up there were guys who used to just jump out of their car and beat random random people up, like random young men, you know, and for a laugh. You know, um shit like that. And it happens all over the world. Um, I don't know yeah, what yeah. the answer is. I really don't know because it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't like, what, what this is a huge issue for me because obviously we've been around. Homo sapiens have been here for I don't know what three hundred thousand years or something. We've apparently been around, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know we're still here, and this is still a problem. And you know we haven't got corporal punishment in the schools now, and we're trying to educate children. But bullying is still massive. Um, you know, it's, apparently there's, there's a lot of sexual assaults and rapes in the schools nowadays uh, from other yeah. students you know, in mixed schools and stuff. Uh, apparently it's a thing. And apparently even in single sex schools, um, <laughs> boys are getting raped by other boys. It's, it's fucking awful. Right. But when you see the kind of gratuitous acts of violence in discos, um, on the street, you know, it's terrifying. It's fucking terrifying. I don't know what it's like in your parts of the world, but you know, I've been around the world a bit and I've seen like, you know, big cities and stuff, and you know, teenage gangs and stuff, and stabbings and hidings, and you know, people are afraid to walk around at night because, or even during the day. <laughs> um, I don't know what the fucking answer is. Obviously, we need to put more money into policing and stuff, but again, that's another fucking area that needs work as well. And yeah. on the matter of policing, I would say, I would say, on in terms of policing, my view is 
fundamental thing that we need to do in terms of policing is introduce psychometric testing. Um, we need to put a lot of money into it and we need to analyze who we're accepting for these very important roles. Um, and by that, I mean, we need to weed out the people with any kind of antisocial uh, personality uh, or yeah, lack of yeah, empathy. That's, that's, that's um, a because good these point. roles are very, very important. And, yeah, and I think that's a fundamental thing that should be done in all recruitment of all, all um, important you know, roles, like especially the police. Uh, because Cause... these people are very, very important, and, and we do need them. And I, my, my hat yeah. goes off to anybody who wants to dedicate their life to these dangerous jobs that protect people. I mean, it's a very important role, and fair play to them for doing it. Um, and I'd like to see them getting paid more again, because they don't get paid much. I don't, sure. it, it, you know, as a, as a society, we, we've got it topsy-turvy. Like, we're, we're not paying enough money to the people who do the real work, the real, you know, the, the things that are important. To the you know? essential workers, um, yeah police, nurses, yeah, the essential workers, teachers. Um, and therefore, what are we attracting? But, you know, people who don't really want to do the job, people are doing it as a plan B, plan C. And again, when they get the job, they're frustrated by life. They can't feed, they can't feed themselves properly. They've got, they, they've got loads of bills. Perhaps they've got families that they're struggling to feed. Um, and you're creating these agitated, stressful people who, and when are you in stress? You don't make very good decisions when you're stressed. When you're stressed, you make decisions that are a bit chaotic and you know, your mind's not calm. You need a calm mind to make good decisions. So we're creating very stressed individuals. And that's why we're getting the problems in society in terms of policing. Anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, that was all good points there about uh, you know, how do we channel that uh, you know, frustration yeah. and everything, you know. I mean, is there you know, there's a lot of sports and stuff people take part in, there's uh there's lots of activities that we already have to help uh, alleviate some of that stuff. But, you know, just finding, yeah. you know, at-risk people and getting the resources to them and helping them out, I guess, is the most important thing. Yeah. I think one and of also, the key things, like, is to instill, instill empathy, instill empathy yes. in young people. How, how do you think we, should, we can do that? I think you kind of need to show them that it sucks to suffer and uh, suffer. But how, how do you do that? I mean, you know, just talking to them is one aspect and getting them to think about, you know, like uh, like Mark was talking about uh, being against gay marriage and being against abortion and all that. I guess in the past, I've been kind of like that, you know, and uh, I guess I had this class about, you know, bigotry and stuff like that. And uh, they were just everyday examples, you know, like how people look at uh, young people, how people look at the elderly, how people look at women, how people look at men. And, you know, it's just uh, the class had an effect on me. It's just one class, you know, just one day. The English teacher just talking about this because you know, we're saying, you know, our hairdressers, oh, they're all gay, you know. It's kind of <laughs> really dumb take on things, you know, when you're a teenager. But, uh, yeah, just yeah, so, so your, your teacher actually, your, your, te your teacher actually took time to correct your kind of perceptions. Yeah, yeah, kind of biases we had and kind of jokes we were making and stuff. And, you know, it you just yeah. took the time out to actually address That's it. That's interesting because I, I, I have to say, I have to say, I never had that really um, in my education. I never had teachers um, really standing up for things like that. Um, so it's good to know that people are, they are doing that. And I think it is important. But, you yeah. know, it, it, it's, it's, it's so difficult. And I, I, it needs so much, it needs cross sections of society to get involved and it needs people checking on each other it needs people talking it needs you know, we need to talk to young people parents need to talk to their kids brothers and sisters need, aunties and uncles need to talk to people who are you know at school or in town and see what the hell's going on in their life um, and they need to take an interest in it you know um, that's the only also, way we need more interaction yeah also like if you watch the media like if you watch how a cop is portrayed in a film He's going around shooting everybody and everything. Like, you know what I mean? That's not how the police should be. You know what I mean? It's, it's how they're portrayed in the film, but like, because it's exciting and it's high octane. But that's not how we want people to imagine the job of being a police officer, right? Like, yeah. Well, I, I you, you, you bring up an, another interesting matter because I worry a lot about the narratives that are pushed in films and the kind of genres that are out there. Like, I just, I don't know why some horror movies have to be made because they're so gory. The stories are, you know, spurious in terms of their, you know, 
cautionary, then what, what are they offering in terms of a narrative? Oftentimes only like gore and stuff. And yeah, I wonder about, you know, a lot of films, like what is what effect are they having on society? But I suppose that's such a huge conversation. Um, we would have to talk about that another time. Yeah, yeah. Um, it depends on the film. It's the issue here as well. Like, I mean, there's one of the examples of horror films that have a deeper message, you know, about depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, psychosis, all that kind of stuff that shows up, you know, um, you know, uh, sleep paralysis. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Well, I think um, I think this this is this is this is connected to um, you know young people and and, and the violence of young people and you know mental health of young people because it's not happening we're not protecting young people from you know you know traumatized traumatized we're not we're not protecting them from traumatizing imagery film music computer games uh like so many young kids are watching like really harmful stuff that is affecting them psychologically and it is you know they haven't got yeah. the brains to work out what's right what's wrong um, we really need yeah. to do more. And and I, I mean, this is a from, comment. Like I, I remember recently. I'm not saying. I'm not saying to make them. I'm not saying to keep them stupid. I'm not saying not to sure. keep them stupid and naive. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying for the benefit of society, we need yes. to protect them from these things because they're not. Uh, their brain isn't able to function properly. Their brain isn't able to deduce what is right and what is wrong. They're, and they're getting psychologically affected by it. They're, they're thinking it's, it's kind of normal. They're, de they're being desensitized to violence and stuff, you know? So we need, we need, yeah. that's why we need to protect them from that stuff. Yeah, like, uh, like Pornhub, um, they're doing 90% of their videos recently because I guess they were going to be sued or whatever, but there was a lot of videos up there that shouldn't have been there, you know? There was like videos people uploaded of people who were underage. There was videos up there that are you know, violence, there's videos up there, just of all sorts of crazy stuff, you know, and they ended up deleting it all, but people have been calling for that for a long time, so it's like, that's not really considered a social media website the way YouTube is, but YouTube used to be like that when ISIS used to upload the, head, the headings and things, I don't really see it maybe as much now, but, you know, when social media started, like, it was very extreme. Well, I'm, I'm glad that some of that harmful pornography has been removed um, you know, and, and, and yeah, that's something else that I suppose it's positive that these things are people are trying to deal with them. Um, in terms of the harmful pornography, I'm happy to see all that shit removed and like, you know, the victims protected, their anonymity, their privacy protected. I think it's terrible that these poor people are, you know, being um, denigrated in such a way. Um, but, you know, the other stuff you mentioned, it is unfortunate, but it's also happening in the world. So there is this sure. line where you know, these these terrible things, these atrocities that you've mentioned, um, we can't hide them totally from public eye uh, because um, you know these things are happening, and it is important for humans to know what is happening in the world so that we can help people, so that we can protect the vulnerable, so that we can protect people who are in danger, um, and so that we can eradicate um, you know evil. Um, if possible. Um, so again, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but we just need to make sure that young people aren't seeing it. Sorry, Mark, um, we, we, we've taken over here. Have you got any opinions on this before we kind of start winding down? No, I, I, I just have to go in a few minutes, so I don't, I don't have much. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I suppose we can uh, leave it there. I'll, uh, I'll just say thanks very much for joining us uh, today. Uh, Mark, I'll let you say a little outro and uh, Wicked, you can say something afterwards. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for the chat. I, I really enjoy um, these chats and getting to know people and understanding multiple perspectives. And yeah, I always learn something new from these things. So uh, thank you. Cool, cool. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I yeah, thanks for having me on. You know, it's nice talking to you guys. Uh, you know, I like Merrick's videos. I watched your Under the Sea video. It was pretty good. Um, yeah, I uh, I guess I just want to apologize for going off there for a little bit. <laughs> I had to go. My dad wanted to talk to me. But uh, yeah, it was nice talking to Ellie. And uh, th thanks for having me on. Yeah, anytime. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, chat again soon. All right, take care. Bye.